So we had some fun last time getting our code to run. We have an animation of a ball going up and coming down, but it's not really a projectile yet, right? I have the idea that projectile means that it's going to move laterally in addition to vertically. Well, it's pretty straightforward to make that happen because all I have to do is change the initial conditions, right? Once you have the physics set up, right? This up here is the only physics in the code. The rest is just setting it up. Then what I can do is start to change the ball's initial velocity, right? I can give its velocity vector a, a, a horizontal component, an X component. Let's suppose I make them equal. Let's suppose I make them 20 and 20. If I click run, now I get a traditional projectile. And so what I like about this process is that I've just now seen that going from tossing a ball up and down to throwing it at an angle is really the same problem. It's just a question of what the initial conditions are. It's also interesting to me to note that it took the same amount of time. That's a pretty fun demo that we sometimes do in physics class, have something go up and down, have another one go at the same speed with the same vertical speed and go and, go and launch this way. It takes the same amount of time for them to reach the ground. So I could have one go up like this, I could have one go over like this, it'll take them the same amount of time, which is pretty cool. No matter what I make this horizontal velocity, right? I can make this horizontal velocity 200 meters per second. I get a much broader trajectory. It looks like skipping stones, still 4.08 seconds. Kind of cool, because that time is only determined by how far, it how long it takes to go up and down. I could also, just for the sake of ease of viewing, you notice how it's all um, uh, it's all empty over here. I could set this over to the left a little bit. Um, let's let's say we set it over at negative ten, and then when I go to launch it, I've got a little bit of room uh, uh, to expand into over there. Uh, obviously, I can keep moving it over left if I wanted, but I do notice I don't know how far that is. Right, that's one of the things you're interested in is how far the projectile goes. Well. All I have to do there is ask, uh, I traveled some distance in the x direction. Right? I just need a way of calculating that. Well, uh, that's going to involve the final position, right? the ball's position at x. I need to subtract off the initial. Right? So why don't we just save that as something. Uh, let's say initial x equals ball.pause.x over here. So I'm going to take this negative 10 and store it as initial x. And then down here, I can say minus initial underscore x. Now watch what happens when we finish. All I did was add that couple of lines. I haven't changed anything about the physics of this thing. It traveled 81.62, oh, I forgot my units, meters in the x direction. Which is kind of cool, right? Again, that's a problem that you often get asked in uh, in a physics homework. The computer can do that for you, and you're still doing the math, right? All that math you would do is still here, and so that the computer is taking care of the minutia, the nitty gritty, the details of it. You're just setting up the equations and letting the computer go. Uh, let's see, what else can we tell about this thing? Well, sometimes you're interested in the maximum height. Well, how am I going to get that? Right, because this thing is continuously changing. Let me introduce you to a wonderful function called max. Uh, so let's add in a line here to uh, find maximum height. And so let's call something the max underscore height. And we're gonna use a function called max. The idea of max is that it takes in two or more numbers and it compares them and it returns to you which one is the higher. So let's just call it max of max height and ball dot pause dot y. Now I haven't defined max height yet, so I'll need to do that over here. Uh, let's see, I think I can just do that here on the same spot. Max height equals ball dot pause dot y. So the way we read this is it's the ball's position vectors y component. So a lot of possessives on there, but you're allowed to change them like that, just like you can in English. Um, so we'll move it along here. Oh, I never actually asked it to print the maximum height. I suppose I should do that. Remember, you can have the computer uh, compute things all day long. If you never have it display the answer to the screen, it's not going to help you. I traveled, comma, what did I call it? Max underscore height meters in the y direction. All right, let's try that now. Run. Arcing up, arcing down. Boop. Cool, so now I can just set the initial conditions, right? I can set the ball's mass, the gravitational field, its initial velocity, its initial position, and I can get out all those 
properties that we ask you for on physics problems. I can get out how much time it took. I can get how far it went, the range. I can get how high it went. Um, I also get this nice visualization. Um, we know from the math that this thing is a parabola. It would take us a little bit of working uh, computationally to figure out it's a parabola, but we will do that in a future video. Um, but what you can do now is you can start to play around with these initial conditions because it's these initial conditions and properties that actually change the trajectory. For example, Let's suppose I were to start this out not at ground level, but farther up. Let's suppose I started at negative 10, 10 in the y direction. Well, let's see what happens here. So now I'm launching from higher, and it's going to take me a different amount of time to reach the ground, right? You notice that it takes me less time because it's like you can imagine this entire parabola just extending on forever. The initial condition just changes where along the parabola you start. Same thing, I could try starting uh, farther over to the left, right? Let's suppose I started at negative 20 over to the left. That really doesn't change much. It just takes the, takes the parabola and shifts it over. I still get the same shape. So those initial, that initial position doesn't have quite a huge impact on the parabola. The parabola itself is still going to have the same curvature to it. But what if I start changing the velocity? Let's get this back to uh, negative 10 and 0. What if I start changing the velocity? What if I have it go faster in the y direction? So say 20 and 50. Well, then you notice I start out with a steeper trajectory here. It looks like I'm going higher, which makes sense. We had it go faster. And it's also taking me longer. But what I also notice is that I get a bit different uh, curvature to the uh, to the trajectory there. I'm able to see more of the parabola, and so I'm getting a little bit different uh, curvature there. Yep, definitely took longer, took just over 10 seconds. Traveled 204 meters in the x direction and 127 meters in the y direction. Pretty cool. And that trend will continue, right? If I keep increasing the, the y component of the velocity, I, I'm going to get a higher, sharper parabola than I had otherwise, um, waiting for it to turn around and come down. I also like this because I can visibly see the thing getting slower and faster, right? So I could see it getting slower going up. I can see it getting faster coming down. I can't really do that when I solve this equation algebraically. That's why I love doing these computer models. So this one was 20 seconds to, to come down, 408 meters in the x direction, 510 meters in the y direction. By the way, if you're an athlete, trying to plan out, you know, tossing your, 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 your projectile in your game or doing a long jump or a high jump or anything, this is a good thing to study. Uh, let's bump this back down to 10. Let's see what happens when I make the X component bigger than the Y component. I don't get quite as broad, I, I don't get quite a sharper parabola. The parabola is starting to open up now. Um, you'll see that become even more extreme when I increase the x component of the velocity. This looks like skipping stones here. You almost don't even notice the, 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 the vertical motion here because there's so much motion happening in the uh, horizontal direction. You also notice that the horizontal distance just gets bigger. The vertical distance, though, is going to stay the same. So even if we make this 500, right? Remember this number, 5.09. My y is going to be the same regardless because the x and the y are happening independently. We don't necessarily see that here, but it's happening with these vector functions because Python knows to add the x components, add the y components, and add the z components. Hey, speaking of z, what happens if we have the thing give a, have a velocity in the z direction? Let's find out. Well, that looked different. Let's zoom out to see what happened here. If you rotate now, you see the thing moved along the Z direction. So Z in V Python is coming out of the screen or into the screen. And so we had it go along that direction now. Same thing, I can make this negative to go the other way, to go away from you. You notice it's getting smaller here. If I pan around here, I can see that the thing moved back into the screen a little bit, right? That's pretty neat. There's no essential physics in that right now. Later on, we'll come up with some scenarios where that is significant. All right, let's keep moving up, try a couple other things. Let's try my favorite thing to vary the gravitational field, right? 9.8 is actually a pretty strong gravitational field for this computer code. Let's suppose we cut it down to just one, one Newton per kilogram. Uh, maybe that's, sounds like that might be mercury but I'd have to check on that. What do you notice about this? It's taken a lot longer 
to come down, right? Taking so much time, I might as well Google gravitational field on Mercury. Gravitational acceleration on Mercury. Oh, gra Mercury is actually 3.7 newtons per kilogram, so it's even it's even weaker than Mercury. It took 20 seconds for that thing to fall. Remember, it was taking us, what was it, under 10 seconds last time? Well, when we go to this moon, not even really a planet, with a gravity of 1 newton per kilogram, uh, it's much smaller, right? It's uh, it, it takes a lot longer to do that. I mean, you could even imagine making your gravity weaker. Suppose you're on, you know, an asteroid or something. Then that thing is really easy to throw up. You notice that that here, I can't even tell that it's a parabola. It looks very straight, right? Because if I made that gravitational field zero, I would get a line because I would have no force. No force means a constant velocity. Constant velocity means the thing continues along its path the way it was going initially. This is going to take a while. Let's take a little break. Oh, uh, okay. One is actually closer to the moon because the moon is 1.62 newtons per kilogram. So that, for some reason, I had it in my head that the moon had a stronger one than Mercury. But I guess Mercury is bigger than the moon, so I guess that makes sense. We're still running this? Goodness, this is weak gravity. But you notice it's still a parabola, right? As long as there's even a smidge of gravity acting on this thing, it's going to be a parabola. Which leads to the question, what can we do to make this not a parabola. For that, we're going to have to introduce some additional forces. We'll do that in a future video. Oh, we landed. We finally landed. That took 200 seconds. 200 seconds on this asteroid. Uh, we went 4,000 meters in the x-direction and right about 500 meters in the y-direction. By the way, just to note, when you're reporting these things to your instructor, this number is 500. None of us wants to see 499.995 meters. We want you to we want to see you round that for just for the sake of ease of communication and for having an easy number to work with, right? Um, okay, let's try one more thing. Let's put the gravity back to let's put it to five, I think. Um, let's see what happens when we change the mass. So let's run this with a gravitational field of five. Okay. We got 4, 80, and 10. Remember those numbers, 4, 80, and 10. I'm going to drastically change the mass, right? Remember, 4, 80, and 10. Let's bump up the mass by a lot. 4, 80, 10. 4, 80, 10. Surely the mass is going to change these. 4, 80, and 10. This is the big lesson in this. As long as the only force you have is gravity, mass is going to cancel right? Because I have, let's go back up to the animation loop. I have the gravity, I have the mass here, right? Mg y hat, negative mg y hat. So the mass is going into the force, but then it's being divided out here. So no matter what value I put in there, it's going to cancel. Uh, side note, don't put in zero because the computer doesn't like dividing by zero. But as long as I don't put in zero, the mass is going to cancel. So you can make the mass whatever you want. It's going to get you the same trajectory, right? This is something that they want you to learn in an intro physics class, that the mass cancels, which is why sometimes they skip straight to the acceleration. I don't like to do that because that doesn't happen with every force, right? In the next, or in, in a couple episodes, we're going to um, start working with drag and the mass is going to matter with drag because it's not going to cancel there. So what I think we'll do in the next episode is we're going to start using the power of the code to display more of these animations because it's nice to have one and then the other and compare them, but it's kind of difficult to remember what's going on with them. So we're going to see how we can animate multiple of these projectiles in one go.